Bible says that the trumpet will so let Jesus take care of the sin problem. It is really a heaven solution, a God solution. That's our emphasis. So we have assurance of salvation. And there is no force on earth that can withstand what God is about to do. Welcome to Whispering Hope Lesson Study. We are in the third quarter, Rest in Christ, and we are on lesson number three, the root of restlessness. And today we are studying the root of restlessness. But before we do so, we have elders Richard and Joseph with us to navigate us through this morning study. Gentlemen, welcome. But before welcome. we go, we're welcome. gonna ask Elder Joseph to pray for us, and we'll ask Elder Richard to read our memory text. Our memory text being James chapter three and verse sixteen. Elder Joseph, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we are so thankful for you sparing our lives to see this new week. Lord, we, we come with these challenges, but we know that you are God. You have set the path and you ask us to just follow after your ways. As we go into the lesson this morning, I pray that you will be with moderate myself and all those who are in the listening public that as we discuss this lesson today, that we will be guided by your Holy Spirit and only the truth of your words will come out so that hearts and minds will turn to you and will be willing to submit themselves to your command, your, your leading, and be saved in your kingdom and you shall come. Thank you, because I've asked it all in the name of Jesus with thanksgiving, amen and amen. Amen, amen. 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 Our memory text is taken from James chapter 3, verse 16. James chapter 3, verse 16. And I'm reading from the King James Version. And it says, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Okay. And Elder Joseph, please turn to John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 2. James, in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 6, King James Virgin. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I Go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 1 oh. to 6. Okay, so uprooting restlessness. And there's a question here that says, in the midst of our own restlessness, what can we do so that our heart will not feel troubled? Elder Joseph. Well, well the text is very clear, you say. Believe in me. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So right from the outset, the text points us straight to Jesus Christ. He said, believe in God. Believe also in me. So he's pointing us through the heavenly throne, the heavenly power. That's what he's pointing us to. To God Almighty, through Jesus. And once we believe, Believe in Jesus as he speaks about the God whom we should trust, then that is the source of our power, our foundation. 
He is pointing us to God through him. And if we believe him, he, Jesus, on earth today, we believe exactly everything he's telling us about the Father who is in heaven. Elder Richard, verse 3 says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there, you may be also. But interestingly, it, starts, it says, if I go, and it seems, this seems to be a conditional clause, and was it intended to introduce an uncertainty? If I go, that, that clause seems to be conditional. It seems conditional if you're going to... Yeah, it's going to seem conditional if you start the, you know, start the reading from that particular text. But let's look at what's going on. Just the chapter before that in chapter 13, when, you know, what we call the Last Supper, Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and one of the things he said, that one of you is a traitor. The disciples were, were, were troubled hearing that one of you is a traitor. And, and then we know that when Judas left, um, many of the disciples thought he was going to go take care of the business of the group. And, and so, but mentally, they're still troubled. And then Jesus is now speaking to them about leaving. So obviously now, you're looking at a, a group of people who find hope in Jesus. Because you remember, in that time and era, that the people at that time was looking for a deliverer and misunderstand the Messiah. And, and so they are now looking for someone uh, believing that they have now find this person who's going to overtake the Roman rule and defeat them and free them from that bondage. And so now they're in a place of, of comfort, a place of hope and thinking, okay, well, I have the confidence now, we have the confidence now that things are going to take place. And, and so when Jesus speaks to them of, of, of leaving, of his death, you can understand now they are confused, they're troubled, and they're worried. And so Jesus now has to give them that hope and that assurance that, listen, you know, it's going to be all right. And so when you start from the beginning, verse 1, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus is telling them, relax yourself. Take some time. You know, slow down a little bit. So let not your heart be troubled. And then he, and as, as the elder Joseph writes, you believe in God. So, you know, in that time, everybody believed in God and they believed that God was going to, you know, the promises of Abraham was going to give unto them. So he's saying, you believe in God. Well, if you believe in God, believe also in me. And then he gave them that assurance that in my father's house are many men. And so he's telling them, look, I have this place, this room for you. But then when it comes to know, but if I go, I'll go to prepare places. I'm going to prepare places. So he's telling them, I'm going to find, go to a place where I can gift you. But that if I go, now that may sound conditional. But what he's saying to them, he's telling them, listen, look, I am going somewhere. And if I go, I will come again. So he's, saying, he's trying to say, I'm not leaving you forever. I am going somewhere to prepare for you. So when I go and I come again, I will receive you. So I will welcome you. So he's giving them the hope. He's giving them the assurance and the confidence that they can rest themselves assured that everything is going to be all right. Okay, so it's not if I go, it's when I go. But Ella, Ella Joseph, Ella Joseph, yes. at you, um, we're, we're, we're looking at uprooting restlessness. And last week, we went through the whole study of, of restlessness and being rebellious and yes. the rest in, in a wilderness in last week's study. But what, what, what are the key um, elements Factors in overcoming division and selfishness and hypocrisy and talk to us. You see, what do it, you overcome that? No, it, this is talking about resting in Jesus, right? Uprooting. And for us to overcome this is to cement ourselves in the studying of the word and having Jesus as a uh, Jesus' character as our character, all right? And when we find Jesus and have him as our character, we will do the things that Jesus himself do. We will go about doing good. We will go about witnessing. Uh, we will, Ephesians 4.32 says, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. 
So once we find Jesus and we find that the things that we do here on earth today that will bring joy and peace and comfort to other people's heart, it would give us the same joy and peace to our heart. Nothing is sweeter than in witnessing. Have you ever gone out witnessing? Knocking on doors and people responding? It's the sweetest thing you can do. You feel an overwhelming joy. You feel as if you are, you, you are fitted and filled with the Spirit of God. You find, you find love when people are responding to you. So, so, so then we see the only hope where we can uproot restlessness and rest in Jesus is to do the will. Christ says that we must occupy till he come. He said, go ye therefore and teach our gospel. Matthew 20, 19 and 20. So once we find ourselves being occupied doing what God tells us to do, we would. Another thing I want to say with this if. You see, if I go and prepare, it's a preposition. If I go, it's a big if. if is that that he's not going to go? He's going. But it's a preposition. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And once you understand that, that the preposition is Christ himself is going to prepare a place for you, then your heart can't be troubled because you know for sure that he who cannot lie, he who cannot make a mistake, he who knows all things, have told you so. So you can rest and assure that the promise of him going and returning for you is secured. Elder Richard, in this world, we are going to go through stuff. We are hurt, we feel pain, we are tired, we feel worn out, we are sick, we go through disappointment. And we are told that he is the light, not just any light. And we have, we have promised abundance light in him what what's the difference what's this abundant life all about that we can well, find in jesus you know when we well, when we're going through troubles and um, restlessness in our heart we, we first must recognize uh, the need for the holy spirit because only the, the holy spirit can grant us that peace that passes all understanding you know which is mentioned in john 14 27 you say you know my peace i leave with you and so we have to first recognize God, you know, the Holy Spirit. And then we have to actively you know, remind ourselves of not to be troubled. <laughs> and how do we do that? In the Deuteronomy 11, 8, you know, gives us that, you know, and, and let us know that, you know, God's word is truth. Now, for us to have abundant life, it simply means to be contented. You know what I'm saying? Because before Christ came, people were living. You know, and if you're going to look at the, the passage of Scripture, you know, I have come to give you life. Then what were people doing before when they're not living? So Christ came to give them not only to, to, for them to have that confidence, but for them to understand that you know the way living in sin is going to only going to bring you death. And so when He said He come to bring them that light, that light is what is truth. God's word is truth. It, you know, and so we have to recognize well what what's truth and what's not truth. And in living in Christ, while we're living in Christ, we will have the contentment in life. We'll be satisfied. We won't be longing for everything and, and looking for any and everything. But we'll be confident and have that, that assurance that everything is going to be all right. And, and so his promises will rely on the promises of God. And so when Christ came to give life, now we, we also should understand that he, has, he came to defeat Satan at the cross. And so dying on the cross is now give us that confidence that we can come to him and, and repent of our sins and our sins will be forgiven and looking forward to eternal life. And so I live in an abundance of life and basically living in contentment, satisfaction for what we have and what God has blessed us with. So Elder, Elder, Elder Joseph, in, yes. in, in, in other words, speak of abundance life, we're talking about our eternal home, Eternal, eternal life. Um, Elder Richard spoke of the sacrifice Jesus died on the cross for us. Uh, but, but how possible? Is it possible for us to to enjoy abundant life now here on earth, Elder Joseph? Of course. Hear this word. You see, abundance life is knowing Christ, right? Just as He have promised the children of Israel that he's going to feed them and give them all that they want. Here is what, you see, it's a relationship. 
And once you're in a relationship, it's a giving and receiving. Okay? All that you have belongs to Christ. Okay? And if you give to Christ, Christ gives to you so you can give to others. And then you have abundant life giving and receiving. Hear what Malachi 3.10 says. And this is talking about a relationship. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that they may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven huh, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And uh, Richard says, look, it doesn't matter how bad things are down here. We can be comforted in knowing that, look, he has gone to prepare a place for us, a place where there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. But in, in all of this, with all of our suffering and our hurt, you know, you know, in perfection, you know, you know, we can say, how can I gain? How can I gain this promise? How can I, how can I be assured that I am included in this, that I can gain in this eternal life and you know, this place that we have gone to fear? I mean, my weakened state. I mean, my weakened state. How, how, how? You, you know, um. John 3 16, you know, and you'll find a uh, reference text, you know, pretty much. John 3 16 says, For God so loved the world. Love. What is love? It, it, the, the thing about it that as human beings, we tend to use love is one of the most misused words I think in this world. You know, and it becomes that now you hear people talk about they love things and like. But God is letting us know that. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe in him should not perish. And I think that's the operative word. Should not perish. And, you know, um, sin is an equal opportunity. In God, and the wage of sin is death. And so whenever we, when we sin, you know, the, the, the goal of sin or the, or the payment of sin is death. But because of God's love, he sent his son to die so we don't have to perish. And so the promise that he has given unto Abram that, you know, the seeds, you know, every family in this world will be blessed to him. He's given of the Messiah, which I know we have studied in previous lessons. But if we, for us to gain that opportunity of living a life in paradise, I'm using paradise, living a life in paradise where there will be no more sickness, no more death, no more tears. So we have to obey God's word. We have to live according to his words and follow his precepts. And in that way, as the brother said, it's about the relationship, building the relationship, getting to know Jesus, getting to know why he died for us, getting to know why he came, getting to understand what, what took place in the Garden of Asia. You see, Because if we don't look at our history or get to know our history, where we're coming from, then we won't know where we're going. You know, and so we have to look at that. And then we have to look at when, you know, in, in Revelation, when John, was writing about there will be no more tears and no more seed. Understand that in Revelation chapter 1, out of the first couple of chapters in Revelation, it seems that it's nothing but trouble. You know, and so here is it now that John is, is writing all these things about destruction and, and those who did, don't, you know, abide to God's word will, will, be, will be burned in, in a hell of fire. And then here comes God again, giving him that assurance again to let him know that everything's going to be all right. So there is not going to be no more death. Now remember, John was on the island of Patmos, right? And so he was isolated and, and, and be alone. And so God is given the confidence that everything is going to be all right. There's not going to be no more death. They're not sea is not going to separate you no more. And so we can also get that and gain that promises of eternal life and, and all the enjoyment that comes with it if we believe and trust in God for it. So, and Joseph. I'm a, yes. I'm a sinner. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm, a, I'm an adulterer. Talk to me. Tell me about the grace of God that can, that, so that I can find rest in my restlessness. 
in my restlessness. Tell me about this grace of God so I can find them. Isaiah 1, 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be as crimson, they shall be as wool. Come, and you will eat the good of the land. Within that calling, God is calling us to give us free grace of repentance. And 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men come slackness, but is done suffering to us word, huh? not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his grace. That's his love. That's his mercy. He opened the door. He, he opened the door. Revelation. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. And notice, notice how this door is set up. This door is set up with the knob is on the inside. There is no knob on the outside. So when so you can't say he's God forced himself upon you. He doesn't force his grace upon you. He knocks gently at your heart door and say, my grace is sufficient. My love for you is sufficient. Just accept me. And if when you hear his voice, all who are listening this morning, when you hear his voice knocking at your heart through the Holy Spirit, you just hold that knob of that you have on the inside of your door heart and open it and Jesus Christ will come right in through. Huh? He says his grace and his mercy is sufficient. And the psalmist tells us, surely goodness and mercy shall follow you. That's his grace all the days of your life. So, 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 so he have extended his love. He have extended his grace. Grace is forgiveness. Grace is pardon. And when we go back first our sins to him, he forgives us. That's grace. And he said, we are sin abound. What? Grace must more abound. He said, just come to him and ask him. And he is willing. He said, but as many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's what God has prepared for us. His grace and his mercy is sufficient. All we need to do is to tap into the source by faith believing, and we have it because it's a gift from God Almighty. Richard, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 22. It reads, Return ye backsliding, children, and I will heal your backsliding. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. And so the question is, what does God ask us to do? And then, what will he do for us in response once he would have done that would he ask us to do? Well, well, back the slide, well first of all, the, the pastor said, we turn to him and be backsliding. But backsliding, backsliding um, basically is going contrary to God's work. And so he, you know, we're separating ourselves from God. And he said, return unto me, ye backsliding. Now, first of all, he said, when you return to me, backsliding, there are a couple of things that benefits you'll get. One, you'll get healing. He said, I will heal you. Diseases will not fall upon you. And those are promises. He says, um, you know, the weeping that we may weep for, for troubles that may come upon us. Uh, he, he, will, he will wipe those tears away. We won't have to weep no more. Because things will be good. You know, this, so these promises that he has given unto us, you know, he also tells us that, you know, the confidence that we will have the, the ability to look forward for life eternal. You know, so when we when we go away from the, the, the precepts of God, we are, we are actually losing out or setting up ourselves to lose out on the promise, his promises. And the ultimate promise is that the promise of eternal life. And so in, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah is writing to a nation who has, who has forever seems to be going away from God. You know, and in all what God has done for him, um, freeing them from Egypt, freeing them from the Babylonian captivity, they still go back into doing things that are contrary to God. And God is saying to them, look, I will heal your nation if you come back. To me. If you return to me, I will heal your nation. And, and that's the promise that God has given them. That's what Jeremiah was writing about. That what God has given unto him, that 
told him to do. So he's writing the message that God has given him. That if you, your backsliders, return unto me and start to follow in my ways, my laws, my precepts, you know, then I will heal your land. I will hear you and heal your land. And um, Elder Joseph, I'm going to give you the opportunity to give the last pitch, to speak to somebody today, to appeal to somebody today, because in, in, in the text in John 14, and, and, and verse 3 it says that it says what? It says that I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And so I just want you to speak to somebody today, appeal to somebody today, right? Because we are, we are recognizing that even, even though we die, even though we die, as seven years ago, even though we die, we have that hope. We have that hope that we will rise again and that we can live with him to claim this promise because he has gone to prepare a place for us. I'm going to give you the opportunity. Isaiah 65, I'm going to bring to you my listening public and my friends and Seventh-day Adventists and whatever religion you are this morning, I'm letting you know. We are talking about everlasting life. And the uprooting from this life is into the everlasting life that would come. That is being with Jesus, being with God, being with our friends and loved ones. Those who have died will come back to life and in the earth. And hear what Isaiah says in Isaiah 65, 21. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, eternal life. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the food thereof. That means you're going to plant your own vineyard. People are not going to come and steal your food. You're going to eat your own fruit. You can give to other people. He said, they shall not build and another inhabit. No. When you build a house, nobody, you're not going to pay no rent. You have your own house. When you build a house, you're going to live in it. And, and uh, <coughs> Oh, my, my, my. And they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they yet speak, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And thus shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Yes. And this is what God, it is the eternal life he had for us. And once we, he, we accept him, he says, for behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with the fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Right? And then he go on to tell us in the new creation, the new creation, and he says, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, said the Lord. We're talking about eternal life here. So shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, said the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcass of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an unhubble upon the earth. It's talking about when Christ comes, my beloved friends, eternal life is given to those who trust him, those who love him. Every evil thing will be uprooted. Life will be renewed and restored and the energy and the vigor of God will be upon all men and we shall worship him in humbleness, in peace and safety. Nobody fighting, nobody quarreling, nobody taking away, nobody wife. Nobody eating, nobody food tree, nobody stealing. What a life God has prepared. All you need to do this morning, my friends, is to accept Jesus. And he says, all these are yours. Eternal life. That's what we're talking about. Uprooting the evil and replacing it with eternal life through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Have a great day. Here you have it, my beloved listeners. We can find rest and we can look forward to that promise of his second return. We can spend the ceaseless ages of eternity with him. May God continue to richly bless you and have a blessed day.
Do you hear that boys and girls? It's almost here. Our first ever children's crusade under the theme Let's Go to Heaven Together. The Jennings SDA Children's Ministry is inviting all the boys and girls from the church and community. Oh yes, we have so many exciting activities just for you. Come out and experience a puppet show, craft time, health nugget, and a special night to have fun in Galore and whole lot more. Beginning at 6.30 p.m. nightly from Sunday 18 July and ending with activities on Saturday 31st July 2021 all at the Jennings Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let's learn about how we can be saved no matter how small we are. I can't wait to see you there. So many rewards in store. Be there.